inside the church, but it should be. And so uh, let's let's drink deeply from the wells of salvation. This is a scripture from Isaiah chapter 12. This is actually what they used to say at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would, uh, this is what's believed on the, on the great day uh, when Jesus stood up on John chapter 7, in John chapter 7, and he, uh, he proclaimed that he was the living water, that anyone who's thirsty could come to him and drink. And that out of them would flow rivers of living water. That's where the name of our church comes from. Well, there was a ceremony in the Jewish culture where they would read Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, and they would pour this water out on the altar. And it was a solemn moment when they poured out the altar, the crowd would just burst out in celebration. And so you can imagine what it would have been like to be in the temple courtyard with thousands upon thousands of people. in a fire on a pillar, 75 feet in the air that lit up all of Jerusalem. And this amazing celebration of God. This is a scripture. I'm just going to read it to you tonight and just um, let it just wash over you. It says, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And this is the scripture. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Can we say that tonight? Can we say, God, you are great? Can we like let out a shout for the Lord of glory? Whoa! Amen. Let that be the quietest shout of our night, okay? <laughs> Let's worship him. Lord, we just thank you for this night, for this opportunity to be with you. We just invite you into this place, God. We know that
that you are all places at all times, but Lord, that your manifest presence would be in this place tonight. That your people that have gathered here would leave knowing that they've had an encounter with you. Lord, we pray continued transformation in our hearts. Lord, wash over our hearts and our minds, all of our being, Lord. Continue to change us and to mold us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
his mercy is more than going to start off in the chorus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. New every morn. I'll see them many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. I see the young man, his mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Um, Trust us. 
So now we have harvesters coming down to do the summer drama. Just now, Andy got me excited telling me about this house that you guys are working to raise money to buy that will help people who are trying to leave drugs behind to come to Jesus. Is this right? I'm so excited about this. Living Waters Church is a light. And I, it is absolutely true that you guys are leading the way and helping inspire us up on that hill. Without question. To remember, you can reach the whole world, but you'd better not forget the people at your front door. So anyway, that makes me happy to be here. So this is your flock. We got that flock, but we're all one flock. All right? The subject of tonight's talk is having a new mind. Hey, don't be afraid. Whenever there's a mighty wind, tongues of fire could be next. Hang in there. That'd be something. Take some of down here with you. someplace to someplace. We come from a flock to a flock. Jesus said that he is the good shepherd, but he doesn't say he goes and finds sheep that have no flock. He says in John chapter 10 that he comes to where all the sheep are, flocking around, hanging out with each other, and he calls his sheep out by name. So, for those of you who know Christ as Savior, you had an experience where you were in another flock. And I don't know what flock that was. As you, as you work to help people coming out of drugs, how many of you have ever been a part of that flock? Um, it has its good things, it has its camaraderie and its friendship. And it has its bad things. It's completely self-destructive, and it robs you of ambition and of life itself. But it's a flock. It's a group. You could be in the flock of the outlaw motorcycle gang. You can be in the flock of the firemen. You can be in the flock of almost anything. And there you are. You know what the Bible says we are as human beings? Sheep. So I want all the kids to make a sheep noise with me. Jace? Can you help me out? Who knows what noise a sheep makes? Uh, huh? uh, that was kind of rough. That was kind of rough. Okay, I, apparently you guys have never heard one. So I'm going to do one for you kids, and you're going to copy me. Ready? <laughs> now go ahead. So, okay, we're done with that now. So, we are sheep, and we're in a flock, and we're, we're sitting there eating our grass and hanging out with the other people in our flock who also are lost and don't know Jesus, and we're chewing the grass, because that's all sheep pretty much do is chew grass, and we're doing nothing but chewing the grass. Then Jesus comes and sees a whole bunch of sheep out there, and you know what he does? He calls our names. He, he, he says, Monica. And Monica, she was lost, and she was in sin, and she was eating her grass. And she hears the Lord call through his spirit, Monica. And she goes, oh. <laughs> And then she turns and starts to walk away. And then her friends say, where are you going, Monica? And she says, my shepherd called me. And they said, what are you talking about? You don't have that shepherd. You're, the, you're with our flock. She says, I know, but now that I've heard his voice, I know I'm in his family. And that is the metaphor of the experience that you have when you come to know Christ. 
I was just talking to one of the young men and said, you might go to church sometime. I said, don't worry about whether you go to church. Do you know the Lord? Because once you meet the Lord, everything changes. He puts his Holy Spirit in you. But since you came from another flock, guess what? Has it changed? Your thinking. Your thinking. You've been born again, but the brain has not yet caught up to what happened to you. You hardly understand what happened to you yourself. You need teachers and pastors to teach you what's going on. And you need to start reading the Bible. The brain must be changed. And a lot of Christians' walks are short-circuited before they even get off the ground because their brains, their minds are never made new. When you become a Christian, you begin a lifelong task of learning not to think the way you think. Do you know why I sinned when the devil tempted me? When, uh, I used to sin a lot and really good. I was a very good sinner. Not a good sinner. I was a bad person. Do you know why it was easy for me to sin? Because it came natural to me. So when Satan would tempt me, do you know whose fault that was? Mine. Because he never suggested anything I didn't want to do anyway. And then when I became a Christian... I didn't want to stop thinking the way I thought. But now I had the spirit in me, and I wanted to stop thinking the way I thought. And I had two things going on. And God knows that that's your experience. You may wonder, as a Christian, am I the only one in this church who, who struggles with these evil temptations and thoughts? No, you're not. The Bible says the flesh wages war against the spirit, so we would not do what we want. And our flesh is tuned to the devil and tuned to our old desires. So we have to renew our mind. One of my favorite verses in the Bible I memorized because of Christian rock and roll. I was going to a church that said Christian rock and roll was of the devil. Which made me feel guilty. But there was this band called the Altar Boys. And they had a song called When You're a Rebel. And they, it started with a guy yelling. You know that song? It's, you know how it starts, right? He goes... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And then the guitar would just kick in. It is, it's a very good song. But that was more than a song. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like you've always been. Don't be like everyone around you, but be transformed. Absolutely metamorphized, changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So Christians here, I want you to think about this for a moment. How do you renew your minds? Now, we know the Holy Spirit is our power source, correct? I, I need you to talk back to me a little bit because I can't get folks at Harvest to talk back to me there. And some of you are here now, and some of you are, are living water people. This is pretty laid back. If we can't talk back here. You know, it didn't just used to be black folks who talked back. In the, in the country, white folks could talk back. But I don't want to have a conversation because I'll get sidetracked. you got to say things like amen and yeah and that sort of thing. You with me? Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm like, I'm like, you're going to get me back. That's good. So we know the Holy Spirit's our power source. Amen? Amen. Amen. But some people get lazy. And they want the Holy Spirit to zap them. And they don't want to do the work God wants us to do. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a command to you. In other words, you have to participate. Your mind will be transformed as your life goes on if you participate, not if you don't participate. Your life can go off course. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 2. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. You have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God. You need the spirit of the world. You, you don't realize that when people are doing evil, they're actually being influenced constantly by the devil. You might think Satanism is is like, you know, killing the cat and 
and doing weird things out and having a Ouija board. None of those things are good, by the way. Take, well, maybe the cat thing. No, don't kill your cats. Or maybe it's like listening to little Nas. That's definitely satanic. But most of Satan's work is done on respectable people who would never do anything like that. When you run to sin, when you run to porn on your computer, when you lie, when you steal, when you disrespect your parents, there's a war going on around you that you do not see. And the war is for your mind, and the enemy is the devil. But you don't have to lose that war, because this says we have the spirit not of the world. So let me go on. Verse 16 of that same chapter says, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? Anyone here smarter than God? God never sins. He never does wrong. There's a song by John Prine, and I love John Prine's songs. I had to stop listening to it. Why did I have to stop listening to it? Because in the middle of it, he talks to God, and he says to God, you forgive us, and we'll forgive you. And I thought, that's blasphemous. You do not say to God that he needs to be forgiven. He, he doesn't sin. But you know what else he doesn't need? Advice. What did he say to Job? What was the whole point of the book of Job? Job was a good guy. He was a better Christian than me, and he didn't even know the name of Christ. He was probably a better, more righteous, faithful person than you, most likely. I mean, he's Job. He's one of the big shots. And yet, all these bad things befell him, so that all the rest of us through time will learn the lesson in the book. And what is the lesson that God told Job when Job said, why is this happening to me? I've examined myself. I can't think of a sin I'm doing to deserve this. The people around me know that. I'm not trying to provoke you, God. I just want to know, how come you'd let this happen to me, a righteous person? And do you know the answer he got from God? It's not your business to know. I, now, you might think that's not fair. Will God pick on me and not tell me why? No. I'm going to give you the secret of Job and the secret of why does God bad, bad things happen to me, right? And this is the absolute truth. And you can challenge me. You don't have to accept it. Test it on Scripture. Test, test on what you know about God. The reason God lets horrible, terrible, heartbreaking things happen in this world, in your life, and in my life, is because what he's doing will turn out with the most people coming to know Jesus, and it's the best way to do it. And you may say, well, I don't understand how a person hurting, like Job, could be the best way. And that's where God says to Job, were you there when I made the stars? You don't know how to make stars either. Were you there when I made, made elephants? No, you don't know how to do that either. I don't need your advice. One of the first things to learn if you're going to renew your mind is you're not trying to renew God's mind. Very often I've heard people say that God just wouldn't want me married to this woman. She's awful. <laughs> she don't cook good. She yells at me. She's always offended because I don't brush my teeth for a week or two. And this other woman loves me just like I am. Maybe I married the wrong person. Maybe the, the Lord wants me to go there. And then they start talking to God about how this... I've even heard pastors say God wanted them to divorce their spouse. Now, no one likes divorce. Sometimes we're, we're stuck with it. But when you start giving God advice, well, this is all right. This is all right. I've got reasons why it's all right. There's no longer who has known the mind of the Lord to instruct him. You're telling him what's right and wrong. I've seen Christians go that way with gay marriage. They say, well, maybe we were wrong. Is that fair? Why can't two men who feel this way be married? It doesn't make sense to me. Well, does it matter if it makes sense to you? No. No. The American way is rules only count if they make sense. By the way, I believe I'm a true American. I think rules need to make sense. And I have trouble with rules that don't make sense. 
I let the people of Harvest know this, and they still haven't fired me for it. But when you used to go into those parking lots, and it would say, for expecting mothers, they had such good parking places. You ever seen them signs? They have a store. And then I'd have one of my daughters with me. They'd be like 9, 10, 11 years old. And I said, we're going to park right here, honey. And they'd read that sign. And they know I'm a pastor. Like, Dad, it says for expecting mothers. I'm like, well, you're a girl, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I don't even have a boyfriend. And I'm 11. And I'm like, I expect when you grow up, you're going to be a mother. Let's go. Because <laughs> rules need to make sense to Americans. It's the way we are. That's the whole deal with this vaccine thing. The government don't like it, and Americans, and I'm not, by the way, I've been vaccinated. So some people say, well, then you must be up the devil. <laughs> well, I don't mind. But I don't care if other people are. Do what you've got to do. American government doesn't like it, but they've created a nation of people who say it's got to make sense. But unfortunately, sometimes we bring that into God and say God's rules only matter if they're what I want to do anyway. With pot becoming legal, trust me, one thing Andy's going to have to preach about is you're not supposed to get stoned. I'm not. I was talking to a young lady and said, you know, you can come to Christ. He's going to have you give up the sweet cheek, right? That pot. And she says, but I have a medical card. I don't care if the president himself gave it to you. God says, no, you, you're not to take pharmacia. It's occultic to just take a, 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 a chemical just to alter your state. But you'll see Christians doing it. You will see it. You'll see churches that say we're a marijuana happy church. As soon as it goes legal, it doesn't matter. Why? Because of this verse is ignored. Who has known the mind of the Lord? That he will instruct him. And the next verse says, we have the mind of Christ. Okay. Now you have the mind of Christ. And, <laughs> I'm losing my crap. <laughs> well, it doesn't, I'm not hurt as a dandy's flock. I'd be disappointed if I showed up too. Well, if I start looking at you, you're going to leave, too. <laughs> it's happened to me with women my whole life. <laughs> you might say, I have the mind of Christ. And again, you could get lazy. Is the Holy Spirit in you if you're saved? Yeah. Well, that wasn't a trick. You could talk back. That's an easy question. The answer yes. You don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christ. Well, does the Holy Spirit tell you what the Bible says? That was a trick question. I'm going to let you try again. Does the Holy Spirit tell you what the Bible says? Trick question. I'm going to give you one more chance. Does the Holy Spirit tell you what the Bible says? Good answer. You have to read it yourself. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, the Helper reminds you. Right? Why do you think God doesn't just have the Holy Spirit whisper the Gospel of John in my ear so I don't have to study it? He wants me to participate. That's why. So your mind can't be trained if you don't work. Let me show you what Paul said right after he told these people of the mind of Christ. Listen. He said, but brothers, I can't speak to you like you're spiritual men. And they're saying, you're men of the flesh. You're like babies in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. You're not able to receive it. You're still fleshly. There's jealousy and strife among you. So there's Christians in the book of 1 Corinthians who have the mind of Christ, who have the spirit of Christ, and Paul says, you have no idea what the mind of Christ is saying to you. Okay. You with me so far? So how do you grow a transformed mind? How do you grow a transformed mind? Well, of course you read. You've got to read your word. That's actually my last point, but I don't even get there, so. <laughs> the transformed mind. Get this. Living Waters Church is the perfect place to be discipled to have a transformed mind. Why is that? Because the trick of a transformed mind, you're not going to get. I, I don't even want to tell you. I'm going to hold you in suspense. 
No, that doesn't mean he doesn't even talk to me. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's I'm not, you know, it's a good thing, but why is the living water church? Besides reading the Bible, the transformed mind requires something very important. I'm, I'm going to keep you in suspense. Anyone have any idea what I'm going to say is necessary? I bet you no one here can guess. I'll play stuff the pastor. I bet any of you know that. Well, you might. What does the transformed mind, you know what it mean, needs? <laughs> Kindness to other people. If you don't put into practice what Jesus says, he won't tell you what, what he says means. He won't transform your mind. You stay fleshly. Paul could teach you. The Corinthians' problem is they didn't love one another. Let me read this to you from a familiar passage for some of you. Philippians 2. He says, look. They didn't say look. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm telling you, I looked at them and they're gone. They're not leaving, they're just wandering. I'm teasing. I really am. I, it's okay. They can... If you have love, if you have compassion, if you have fellowship, if you have affection, what should you do with it? You should make his joy complete by uniting with the brethren in love, in spirit, in ten on one purpose. It says doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. This is all how you're supposed to behave, isn't it? This is all how you're supposed to treat people, Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike, you're lost. You don't even know what you're talking about. This isn't one of those verses that's about the way you think. Well, it is. Keep going. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but the interests of others. Are you doing that? If you're not, see, here's the deal. For those of you who are still here, I'm going to give you all the secrets here. The, the biggest problem with most of the Christian consumer industry in America is it is it um, like I got out of the light is it requires you to buy things so you can learn things to live a, a Christian life all by yourself most of it really is and I don't care if it's charismatic or fundamentalist they're either telling you lady woman thou art loosed if you're charismatic <laughs> Right? They're telling you how to have live a life of holiness and contemplation if you're a conservative. And it's all about you. But the Christian life is impossible to grow in without treating and loving other people the way Jesus said. It, it's just impossible. You literally will not grow. You'll learn things. You can go to every Sunday school class. You can repeat back all the right answers. Your mind will not transform. And you were saying, Pastor Mike, prove it to me. Okay. After he tells everybody all this stuff about treating one another with love, he says, have this mind you with me in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a need to exercise the brain. If I just yelled at you, read your Bible more. Well, you'd expect that. You'd say, yeah, that's not true. But that doesn't always work, does it? How many of you have done community outreach or mission trips or the, the retreat stuff with Pastor Andy and Living Waters? Anybody here done anything? Okay, you, okay. Andy's done some of himself. You guys have? On those days you serve, when you guys, do you guys ever get together near the end and chat and talk about what happened, maybe have a little Bible, a little prayer? Do you ever do that stuff, Andy? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that when you feel the closest to God? After you've served a bunch of folks and you sit together with your pastor and he leads you in a prayer. Why is that? 
because you're activating what you learned from the Bible, and now your mind is being transformed, and you are being changed. Right? Well, I'm going to go get one more. I've got a few more, but I'm going to slow it down and give you just one more. Right now, everybody in the world is scared of everything. I hear a lot of Christians who are very concerned about tomorrow. Are you concerned about tomorrow? No, no you are. Well, maybe I don't need to say this far. <laughs> well, that's the answer, isn't it, sister? So, there, there is a fear of what will come next. There is a sense that our country is falling apart. Whether it is or not, time will tell. But how many of you feel that? that the wheels seem to be coming off our society. People don't get along with one another. The laws don't seem to matter anymore. People don't feel as safe. The financial system is looking scary. The immigration system is looking scary. China is looking scary. And, and we don't know what tomorrow brings. And being a Christian now is starting to be seen as something that's hateful. Not just your Christian stance and be a Christian is hateful. They're trying to find ways. I just saw um, uh, one of these apps people use, I don't remember which one it is, but they're going to find a way to put a pro-choice sticker on it, like on the app, so that if you, it's not Lyft or one of them, but it's another one where you do business through the app. And if you can identify yourself as being pro-choice and against what happened in Texas, the pro-life law. And I was thinking, why would you do that? Well, the reason you do it is to show that you don't agree with the Christians. Your morality is the morality that you think is, is what the world wants you to have. But it's not so much Christian. I mean, what if it was your child that was having that you? I like that you're getting into it, sister. I agree with you. Any human, what you're saying is any human being should see that it's a baby. Right. But they don't. Why don't they? Because the God of this world has yep. blinded the eyes of unbelievers. But think about this. If they start marking things that show whether or not they have nothing to do with consumerism. Airbnb did this a couple years ago. They tried to say, okay, as a policy, if you have a house, you can't say, I don't want two women sleeping in the bed in my room when they rent it. Right? So they're starting to identify us. As wrong, not just someone they disagree with. And there's people getting scared about that. These vaccine mandates are insanity. Over in Australia, they're beating people up and taking them to jail, and people are afraid of the government. No! No! The mind can be overwhelmed with all the knowledge, all the details, all the data coming in. Can't you? You got smartphones. If you have a kid with a smartphone, can I tell you something? You've made a mistake. The yeah. kids won't like me for this. Take them away, especially if it's a boy. They won't. Especially if it's a girl, too. Okay, <laughs> if you have a girl or if you have a boy, <laughs> you've got to limit that usage. Boys will look at porn, and women will destroy their souls on social media. They're too young to handle it. But then you think of the adults. You're hooked. The dopamine hit. You got to hit the Instagram. You got to hit the Facebook. You got to hit Fox News. You got to whatever is your favorites are. And you check it all the time. You're always, you stop, well, I'm going to look at this. You, you know, I hope people think it's because I'm a businessman. But no, they know. You're just looking at Facebook. And your mind becomes troubled. There's so much noise inside your head. <coughs> What's the avenue to stop the noise and the fear? Anxiousness is when your emotions, responding to your thoughts, start to overwhelm your brain. Right? You look at the world as a scary place, your emotions start to run, then they run back to your brain and say, we're scared, and you're nervous all the time. What's the remedy? Believe it or not, 
God is the remedy to, in the renewed mind. Let me remind you of the text. Be anxious for nothing. That's not don't worry. It can be hard to not worry. It's not saying that. It's to be anxious for nothing. Pass it. Don't let yourself spin out on what's causing you fear. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. By prayer, with supplication, that means asking for what you want. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The response that you Christians have at your fingertips and need to practice and then teach to the people who are lost <laughs> and say, hey, I know a way of peace. You may not be scared. Hopefully you're not. But your neighbor is. Your neighbor is. Your neighbor like, we don't get drunk in there and shoot us and we're both the whole thing going for <laughs> And he's afraid. He's afraid that he's going to get marked, tagged, and stuck in a FEMA camp. You got... It is seriously, you have people saying, it ain't about me, it's about my kids and grandkids, I worry. I want to tell you, it's not godly for us to worry about our kids and grandkids' future. All right, Christian, did I step on the toe? I do it out of love, to set you free. It's not godly, it's idolatry. It puts kids before God. I want you to remember, when you were a kid, your grandparents worried about the world you inherited. But you're raising little champions who are going to be made for such a time as this. Amen. So don't, when you find yourself saying, I'm worried, and I do it too, I have kids and grandkids, worried about the world they inherit, I stop myself and say, no, that's, that's a temptation to sin. God will be in the world they inherit. Amen. My concern is that they know God. Yes. Yes. And we teach them. Be anxious for nothing, but to respond to everything by prayer and supplication with a thanksgiving. Can you be thankful all the time? And that's a choice. You know what thanksgiving is? It's a posture. Does that make sense? You know, like your body, you sit a certain way. It's, take, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental posture you take with God. Thanksgiving, you don't always feel. You want to feel it. Isn't it a great moment when you feel thankful? I don't feel thankful near as much as I want to, but I feel feel thankful a lot more than I used to. And maybe that's because I'm getting old. I don't know. You two old timers in the back leaning against the wall. Yeah, you two. Is that true of you two also? Do you feel more thankful as you get older? Or not? You can say no if it ain't true. It is of me. I, I, I wasn't paying attention. Maybe I was a whiner. But thankfulness is a posture. Most time when we say thank you because someone gives us something, the first thing we think is, I didn't get them anything. <laughs> and, and then, what do we do? We think, I will get them something, give it to them, even it up. Is that thankfulness? Really, it's not true thankfulness. Thankfulness requires that you receive something for which you pay nothing. It just has to, you have to receive more than you give to be thankful. So the posture around God, if you say to him, God, I can't believe how horrible my life is. I can't believe that I got bills and I can't buy all the things I want and everything's going to happen and Joe Biden's going to come and kill us all. That is not a posture of thanksgiving. The posture of thanksgiving acknowledges everything I have comes from God. I'm in a beggar's position. I could be a beggar. Did you know Martin Luther, the great reformer's last words were, we are indeed all beggars. And he's right. So be anxious for nothing, but by everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. If you make that a habit, what's going to happen to you? And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds. Because you see, when we talk about renewing of the mind, it's really hard when you're scared. I know what it's like to be scared. Your mind doesn't slow down. Right now my mind isn't my friend. I can't renew it. I can't even stop it. 
God says respond. To get in that posture of thankfulness and start laying it before Him. But well, will the peace really come? Will it work? It's not a magic thing. It's a relationship with your Father. Make the habit. Wait for the peace so that your mind will be transformed. My final point on the renewed mind. It's so nice and quiet in you now. <laughs> that quieted me down. Um, I'm going to let it go. And I'd have to start up again. And I'd be telling stuff you already know. So I'll sum up with this. You've got to love the Word. And you've got to love your church. You've got to love your pastor. Okay? You've got to respect your pastor. And let me say things the pastors can't say for themselves. The Bible says that it's your job to obey and honor him. Amen. I think sometimes people think they have the freedom to rip and tear at when he ain't listening. Have you ever heard that? No. No. Obey, honor. And you know why it says? Because God has appointed him the guardian of your soul. And it's not profitable for you to make his life and his job more difficult. It means to treat him with double honor. It is to your praise if your pastor has his finance or needs men. It is the praise of his people's obedience to God. So you got to love your pastor. Do you know what else you got to do to love your church? you got to not be fighting with other people in the church. And I don't know what's going on in your church, but maybe in your heart there's someone you don't like. Can I tell you something about that? And it's a good step on your toes, but again, it's a brother loving you. If there's someone you don't like in the church, it's your fault. Now, what I'm not saying is the person didn't wrong you. The person might have wronged you. But have you ever wronged Jesus? <laughs> Let's all talk loud on that one. I know we're quiet now. But everyone who's wronged Jesus say yes when I ask. Yeah. Have you ever wronged Jesus? Yes. Every time we sin. Yes. Is his response to you and me, I don't like you? Yeah. And why does he find it so easy to forgive us and still like us and it's so hard for us? And what about us? We're sinners. And our mind isn't renewed, is it? So, therefore, the problem isn't the sin done against us, it's us. There's ways of making peace. They're in the Bible. If there's stuff that you've got to make peace, follow it. If you can't figure out how to follow it, go to your pastor and say, help me make peace with this person. But if you get to the point where it says, they're not hurting me anymore, but there's nothing I can do to get them to see the problem or apologize. You know what you do then? You be anxious for nothing. But above all things, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God in the peace of God. Because you can say, I'll choose to forgive, and your heart can be ticked off. Because Why? Because flesh wages war against the Spirit. So if you're going to love your church, first you honor your pastor. By the way, I'm not saying that the, you know, you honor what he's doing wrong. If you're, I'm assuming your pastor is obeying God, and I, as far as I know, you've got a great pastor. Amen. Second, you live with, at peace with one another. Third, you treat everybody in the church as if they matter equally. You can't love them all equally because you're finite. And God gives you the order. If you're married, you love your spouse first and most. And if you got kids, you love them next. Yeah, she's touching her husband. Husband, love her the most. You're finite. You can't give equal time to everybody. But nobody doesn't matter. Everybody matters. Every bouncing kid filled with testosterone that can't hold still, which is normal, <laughs> to every elderly man, like Orny over there. Um, <laughs> you guys, I love you. Arnie knows me. 
thing. You know, like, I hope you got it. Now I feel bad. Did I say that? It was a joke. Don't for a long time. That's why I picked on him. Those two old guys over there looked offended when I called them two old guys. So I'm never going to call you two old guys old guys again. Are you son or my son? Oh. <laughs> Let's call him an old guy and him a really old guy. Okay. <laughs> Everybody matters. And let me go farther. And again, it's a good step on a toe or two. The people in your church need to get your love, this may not make sense to you, before the non-believers in your life. This is an extremely important concept that's often missed. Say that again. The people in your church deserve, because you're finite, it can, you've got a pecking order of love that God expects you to have. We love you. We love, your job is love Arnie the most. The human will love Arnie the most and supposed to be you, because that's your husband. Then you love your kids, grandkids. But then you've got to love everyone in your church as best you can in your finiteness. And the next in priority is the law. That may not that that may not seem to make sense because Jesus loved us when we were yet sinners. But let me explain why practically that's what you got to do. If you don't major on loving one another, you cannot do John thirteen thirty five. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Secondly, when we go out and do good deeds and preach the gospel and bring them into Living Waters Church. We're bringing, we're, we're adopting them into family, right? Isn't that right, brother? His brother here was telling me how warm he felt when he came to see Andy, and that's why he's here. He didn't use the words, but what I'm hearing is, this church is my family. Am I right? Yeah. We, if you adopt someone into your family, what if you've got this really good family, and you don't ever adopt anyone in? Well, it's just for you. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. What if you got a family that they all fight, they all throw forks at each other, they're all selfish, they all lie and backbite, and then you go out and tell somebody how great Jesus is, come join our family, because of the Holy Spirit and the gospel, they agree Jesus is awesome, they can't wait to come join the family, and the family ain't that fun. They're not that nice. Many churches do that. They'll do a bus ministry, pick up a bunch of kids from all over town, bring them in, and then treat them like crap. <laughs> so if you're going to love your church, you, you honor your pastor, you make peace with one another, you treat everyone as important, loving as God commanded you, then you've got to go out and seek the lost. Because they are your family too. You just haven't met them yet. There are sheep out there right now chewing on food over in the jail that belong here. They don't know, and you don't know who they are. How will you know? What's the Bible say? Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. How will, so if you go to the jail, which I was talking to Andy, he sounds like you're trying to put together a ministry. And you meet people who live around here. And you tell them, listen, Jesus loves you. If you get out of here, you've got a family. Some are going to respond. you got people living in those houses over there, those houses over there, those houses over there, way up on the hill in West Catania that are family that should be here. You have people in Templeton that are family they should be here. Amen. Right? Yep. So if you love your church, the way you're going to do it is you're going to honor your pastor, take good care of him, uh, follow his lead, help him accomplish the things the Lord lays on his heart. You're going to be at peace with one another. You're going to treat everyone like every single person matters, even the ones that are difficult. And you're going to love the people according to your finite power as Jesus taught you and then you're going to seek the lost. If you don't do things, it doesn't matter if you read your Bible. 
But now let me turn that over. If you try to do all those things and do not learn your Bible, you'll lose your steam. Because what the Holy Spirit works with in you is the Bible you put in your mind. And so we're back to where we started. You put the Bible in your mind and you do it. And that will transform your mind. Um, I plan to have a lot of fun and scream and yell a lot. But I kind of like it that it ended out like this where we could just chat. Um, I... The, the mission of Harvest is to increase the health and size of our church everywhere. What that means to us is we get excited if living waters flows. Right? If you're at this church, you protect it through prayer. Satan hates living waters church. Absolutely hates it. Well, that's not necessarily true because some of them he owns. Let me tell you. A story. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. There was once, there was once this old, old country church, and the pastor was up there preaching away, and he was giving them the fire and the brimstone like he always did, and and they they were scared, scared, scared. What they didn't know is that the, the head trustee was down in the basement fixing the boiler. And as he, the pastor, was saying, and if you don't stop your sinning, you're going to fall right into the fires of hell. <laughs> and when he said it, the boiler blew up. <laughs> and the people didn't know it. And the smoke, they hear boom, and smoke and light come from the cracks in the floor, and the smoke comes up. And then all the people start to scream, Wah! and they run running out of the church saying, Satan's going to get us. Satan's going to get us. And right at that moment, the sixth the trustee comes to the door and pushes it open. He's completely covered with black soot. His hair is standing up when isn't frizzled off. He's covered, covered in coal dust and black soot. And he, 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 he's coming up and he's like this. And someone says, look. And in a panic, they thought, that's Satan. And then the rest of them run out of the door. All but one little old lady. And she didn't leave because she couldn't leave. Oh, no. She's a strong woman. And when that man comes marching up, he hardly knows his head's been banged. He don't even know what's happening. And that lady sits up from up to you, and she plants her cane in the ground. She takes her Bible in one hand, and she looks at old Satan, who she thinks it is. And she says, you listen to me, old scratch. <laughs> You don't scare this person. I've been in this church for 60 years. And in all that time, I've always obeyed you. So you got no problem with me. Because <laughs> some folk, not every church is hated by Satan. He's got some churches where he, he sends all the demons, they go there to get fired up. But Satan hates living waters. I'm certain. I'm certain. I had too many good reports. Okay, so I've never been to Living Waters Church. I knew where it was, was the old place. When Fred Kyson started it, we were cheering him on. We helped a little bit, but not much. He did all the work. We gave him little stuff. Then I heard of Andy. Then I met Andy. And Andy's serving us. Us. He came up to Harvest. He talked to me and told us ways we could help serve the Lord. And then he does it. And then people tell me the stories. Then I see him online. Then my daughter tells me about how great it is. The, the fragrance of good works comes from here. Right? Be encouraged. Keep that up. Let your light shine in such a way that they see your good works. There's a way to do it, and they don't see Christ. But the name of Jesus is here. Amen. Satan hates his church, but he's a defeated foe. Amen. He's a defeated foe. Amen. So, with that said, it looks like the fires of Israel are burning behind us. <laughs> I'm going to end with a prayer and invite my buddy Chris to come back up. And I thank you guys for listening to me. It really is an honor to be here. Um, I know the kids get a little rambunctious, and I don't mind because my kids, that's their job. 
<laughs> um, but I'm really glad to have a time just to chat, as it turned out. Instead of a sermon, that's, you probably hear that sermon. And, uh, and you got a good teacher for that anyway. So let's say a prayer. And Chris, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 15, ready, listen to this. It's very Hebrew. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice. You know, you say, well, we're, wait, wait, we're in the covenant. We don't kill animals. No, no, no. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Amen. Well, what's that? Fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Hebrews 13, 15. We're going to do that so as he gets up here and we pray. Father in heaven, as uh, Moses took all the Hebrews into the wilderness, the one thing they did not have was a godly mind. And their minds were filled with the ways of the false gods of Egypt. And you had to take them up on a mountain and said, go down there and teach them this is the law. And tell them to think about it every day because they've got to change the way they think. And we've learned a lot since then. Jesus came and showed his grace. But that fundamental principle is still the same. As we live in the Egypt that is America, filled with its false gods and idols, it's easy for us to get sucked in and have our minds filled with ways, new and better ways to sin, fears of conspiracies that you said, do not call conspiracy what they call conspiracy and do not fear what they fear. I pray that the angels protect this geographical spot on the earth where your people dwell. Yes, God. And that the devil not have a foothold. Yes. That you carry through these people through the suffering you have for them, for your glory, and through the glories you have for them on earth. That they do a mighty works with every hand that reaches out with a cup of cold water. With every mouth that says, come here, honey, I love you. May your spirit be glad in them. Give them glad hearts. And fill these streets with praise. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask for many brothers and sisters who are right now chewing the cud and in danger of eternal hell that they come to know Christ through these brothers and sisters and come join them and be part of this family. We look for your hand to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let's stand up, folks, and sing a song.
Alright, um, your love defends me. kingdom being here partially. So it, it's it already but not yet. There's still more to come but right now we're, our goal since the beginning of time is to build God's kingdom on the earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show Set our hearts ablaze 
with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come and bathe us now. And we are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom. and welcome them into your kingdom. God, we ask that you would renew and transform us in our minds through your word, that we wouldn't keep the things that you are showing us, but that we would give them away. In Jesus' name I pray.
going to take him out tomorrow. Yeah. Just start up as soon as we stop, and then the smoke. I agreed that it wouldn't rain. Would you stop? Uh, <laughs> it's raining now. Listen, I, I think God's given so much grace in summer serve, we use it all up. Thank you. 